Yesterday, I played probably the best Blitz game of my life. I was playing Entitled Tuesday, which is this huge tournament that happens every Tuesday, and it's an online tournament with some of the biggest chess players in the world. I mean, we have Hikaru participating a lot of times, Magnus Carlsen, Firusha was there yesterday, Hans was playing. Top world grandmasters participate in this tournament as it's only open for title players. Now, I have the title of WFM, but I'm obviously one of the lowest rated people in that tournament. So I always play just as a way to practice chess and get an opportunity to play against stronger people. Because I think that if you want to improve in chess, one of the best ways is to play against stronger people, as that's a challenge. Well, I did get a challenge as in round number... Oh, I actually can't remember what round it was. Six? Seven? Somewhere around there. I faced a very strong grandmaster, and he was rated 3000. I was playing against David Paravyan, a Russian grandmaster who has a peak FIDE rating of 2660. His peak ranking in the world is number 78, and he is an extremely strong chess player. So when I saw that I was facing him, I was obviously terrified. I thought this is going to be so difficult. But what I knew is that I had to play the best game of my life because I really wanted to set a challenge. I feel like when I play against stronger players, I get really motivated because I want to prove to them that I can play well. And I want to prove that to myself too. And that's something that I've had, you know, my whole life. Every time I play someone that's stronger than me, I just play better chess, I think. So the game was so good that I thought that I have to show it to you. I have to analyze it and I have to just, I'm proud, okay? I'm happy, I'm proud. I have to show the game to you. <laughs> so here we have the game you can see that he has a rating of 3039 online and he has a peak blitz rating of like 3160 or something like that which is crazy now before i start with the game stream rewards is happening right now and thanks to you i've gotten nominated as best chess streamer of the year so if you would like to see me win it would be so huge for me it would like really mean the absolute world it would be amazing if you could take your time to vote for me um it takes five seconds to vote i'll leave the link in the description it's category number four you don't have to vote in any other category if you don't want to you just press my name and then you click submit and that's it and that's you know that can make a huge difference for me in this award show which is the biggest award show that we have as creators basically so and as streamers so would mean the world if you like my chess if you like what i do then please consider voting for me Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and show the game. So, I am so excited. He started with the move e4, and I went c5. The Sicilian, obviously, what I play, what I love. I've played this my whole life. So he went knight f3, and I went e6. I typically play this, at least online. Over the board, I'm playing some different things, but you know, I'm not gonna talk about that because that is a secret. <laughs> so you went d4 and this is the open uh, this is the open Sicilian. Main theory, I just captured, captured knight f6, threatening this pawn and now you cannot push here because there's check and you win a pawn. This is a trick that's made me win quite a few games actually. Uh, but obviously at this rating, everybody knows this. So knight c3, knight c6. Now he has a choice if he wants to take or if he wants to go knight b5, which is what he did, and I went d6, this is all theory, that's why I'm going through it pretty quickly. Bishop f4, threatening the pawn, kind of forcing me to play e5, but by playing e5, what I'm doing is that I'm giving away this square for the knight. So this square is going to be a big hole in the position, and actually, the whole opening is going to be centered on who has control of this square. If I manage to take control of the square, which means if I manage to put enough pieces that are attacking the square, and even better, if I manage at some point to play d5, then I am doing either as good or better than white. Like then the position is equal or black is better. So this, is, this square is the most important square in this position. So here theory goes a6, and now this has become a Sveshnikov. So knight a3, you also have the option here of capturing here first, and this will just become another very theoretical line, uh, pawn takes, and then knight a3, and then, you know, this kind of 
yeah, goes a bit crazy. Um, but th th there's several lines here. I definitely do not recommend this opening at a beginner level. There's a lot of theory here that goes very deep. And actually, when I was playing against this guy, I was like, why am I playing one of the most theoretical lines in the world against the Grandmaster? Like, what am I doing, you know? Is this really a smart idea? I don't know. Um, but he went knight a3, and I played b5, threatening b4, forking the two knights. So, so far, everything has been normal. He went knight d5. There's also another time where he could capture here. Um, but he went knight d5, and now I just went bishop e7, defending the knight. So now I'm basically threatening to capture on d5. Um, so he captured on f6, capturing my knight. I took, and now c3, preventing b4. If he does not go c3, then b4 could give me a pretty good position. So another idea with c3 is also to reroute this knight to go knight c3, knight e3, and then take extra control of the square. So here are the main moves to go bishop g5, actually so that after, if knight c2, uh, which is the move that he did, uh, to at some point, well, go bishop e6, and then just if knight here, maybe even taking and then trying to get more control of the d5 square. Like I said, this is literally the whole point of the game. So I castled first and I was expecting him to maybe go knight e3, but he went a4, which is also very logical. And here um, I can either take or I can go rook b8 defending the pawn. Those are two moves that I can do because he's threatening to take my pawn and I cannot capture back because my rook is hanging. And if I go something like bishop e6, then obviously my pawn is hanging here as well. So I captured, and after rook takes, I just went a5 to uh, just keep this pawn under control. If I keep my pawn here, then it's I'm, I'm kind of not able to move the bishop out because the pawn is hanging. So I went a5, he went bishop c4, and I played bishop e6, developing the bishop and kind of threatening here. He castled, and I went knight e7, which is a good move. Once again, putting extra pressure on, uh, on d5. So we played 17 moves here, and I mean, we both had quite a lot of time, and I was feeling very confident about my possession. I was feeling very happy. Like you see, I've only spent 17 seconds up till this point, which is basically a second per move. So he played queen d3, and I wasn't really expecting this, and here I started spending some time because I didn't really know exactly what to do. But I'm really happy because I ended up playing the best move, which is rook b8. And the reason I liked this move was because... I just thought that my rook would be more active here than what it was on a8. But also, I wanted to play queen d7. I wanted to play queen d7, but I couldn't do this move because knight b6 forking. And I, the reason I wanted to play queen d7 was because I thought that if I have my queen on d7 and something like this, okay, no, now the rook is hanging, but let's say the rook goes back or something. Then my idea was that if takes, 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 I wanted at some point to be able to, maybe here I can go a4, but I wanted at some point to be able to go queen e6 and once again try to take control of the d5 square because if I'm able to do this move in good conditions and we trade and I can go d5, I'm going to be doing fine. So like you see, like there's this one theme that I know in this opening and every move that I'm making is kind of because of that. Um, so here, um, I went rook b8 and you play b4, which is the best move. And I thought that I have no other choice than to take the pawn, which I don't know why I spent 30 seconds on that move, but, you know, I'm Anna. Sometimes I just think a lot more than I should. <laughs> um, something that I'm working on. I know you guys tell me in the comments every single video, Anna, stop thinking. Anna, once again, the problem of thinking. Anna, you're slow. Anna, stop being slow. It is not so easy, you know? It's, it's really not so easy. Like, time, time management it's like almost like an addiction like kind of like you're almost addicted to thinking a lot this sounds a bit weird but it's hard to get rid of that habit like it's a habit you know very difficult to get rid of that habit so anyways a takes before he took back with the knight and now i finally played queen d7 i think maybe queen c8 could have been slightly better just because then if this knight moves um the bishop is hanging but i thought it was kind of scary just because I didn't like the fact that there might be, you know, I'm, I'm placing my queen in a position where if this bishop does not exist, I'm losing my queen because of the fork. So I went queen d7, rook a1 makes a lot of sense. And now I finally traded. And what I'm really happy and proud about is that up until this point, I've played at pretty much 100% accuracy. 
And the reason I'm proud about this is because I did not know all of this theory. I knew theory up till maybe move 15. But all of this I did not know. So I was coming up with the best moves during the game, which I'm really proud of. So takes, takes, takes. And I went rugby too. This is probably like uh, an inaccuracy. This is probably not so good. I should probably go F5 here. But I thought it looked a little bit scary. Because I thought that these sort of moves could be scary. But apparently this move is not scary. Because I can take here in between. If he takes, I take. And I get a beautiful pass pawn. And if capture is back here, um, I have queen F5. Which was a move that I missed. And now if we take, then my rook is going to become very active. So... I missed f5 in this position, um, yeah, it was just basically I moved that I, that I missed. So I went rook b2, and now rook a8, and I went g6, which is a good move, because I need to get, I mean, the threat here is to go rook takes, takes, and then basically almost checkmating me. So I have to give some air for the king, the king needs a little escape route. So trades, trades, and now played queen g3 and this is actually a mistake not a mistake but a miss and at his level a mistake because i have this move i only had 20 seconds on the clock though but i have this amazing move queen a4 in this position sacrificing the queen but he cannot take my queen because then i have checkmate so what is the idea with this well the idea is that i'm threatening the rook the rook must move and now i can actually take on e4 and I'm winning a pawn, and if he takes my bishop, I'm taking his knight. So I'm threatening a knight. And actually, this possession, I am pretty much winning. Like, probably, you know, against this, like, opponent, like, it would have been really hard. Like, I, I really don't think I, I, I would win. But, like, this is, like, technically a much better position for me because this pawn is very weak. I'm a pawn up, but I have a lot of chances of winning this pawn, too. The only problem that I have is that my king is weak, but I do not see how I could lose this position. I really think that I could have drawn this if I would have seen queen a4. So queen a4 was just a crazy move. By the way, the time control here is 3 plus 1, so I do am getting 1 second increment per move. I went queen b7 instead because I missed that move. The idea now is that, well, the same idea as queen a4, just that now I'm not threatening the e4 pawn. So I'm threatening checkmate in 1, he went rook f1, and I went bishop d2. And after queen d3, queen b5 was a really good move. We traded in this position. You know, I am not worse. It's move 30. We are at an end game, and it's 0 0.00. Why am I, you know, I would say almost slightly better? Because this pawn is really weak. I have a bishop, which is typically like really good uh, with a rook. Rooks and bishops work better than rooks like knights. But the compensation that my opponent has is that this knight is very strong in the center. So this knight is just, you know, fantastic. And there's no way for me to get rid of it. So I played c4. I went rook b2, just defending my bishop. And now, well, I went rook c2, which was good, threatening this pawn. He went g3 to give some air for my king, for his king. And now I have this move, bishop c1, that just basically traps the rook. And after this move, there is no way for my opponent, really, to, like, properly defend this pawn. Um, the best thing my opponent can do is probably to go knight f6, because if h5, then there's rook takes d6. So probably what my opponent has to do is that he has to go for this pawn. Um, but this knight is so bad here, the knight cannot go anywhere. Um, it's equal pawns. This pawn is very weak. I do not see how I can lose this possession. So bishop c1 is a really good move. I missed bishop c1. I went bishop a5 instead. And that kind of gave him the possibility of activating his rook. But still in this position, like there is almost no way I can lose. And we're right now in move 37. I played f5. Takes, takes, rook here. And I lost on time. Ah! And I cried. No, I, I didn't cry. I didn't cry, but I almost cried. Because I was only getting a second increment. And I just thought for a second too long. I was playing the last moves on increment the whole time. Like, you can probably see that I only had, like, one second, two seconds all the time. But, yeah. I remember that I was looking at it as if D5 worked for, like, a split second. And it was this move that just, you know, made me lose on time. If I just play E4 here, it's just a dead draw. There's nothing my opponent can do nothing it's the easiest draw of my life nothing you know king here i just go rook d3 i defend the pawn there's nothing my opponent can do if we ever trade i mean my king is gonna defend this 
I would have drawn this. I would have drawn a 3,000 if I didn't lose on time there. Like, there, this is the simplest driver. If takes here, we trade. It's three versus three on the same side. It's, it's, it's physically impossible to lose this. You cannot lose this. Now, you might say, Anna, why are you so happy when you lost this game? Well, I'm really proud. And the reason I'm really proud is because I was about to hold the draw with the Grandmaster. And not only that, but I'm going to show you this. If we analyze the game with the computer, the computer gave me an accuracy that was higher than my opponents, 96.2 in quite a long game. And the engine said that I played like a 3,300. And this is probably the, I, I actually am pretty sure this is the highest that I've ever gotten on chess.com. So I was just really happy after the game. And it kind of ignited the spark within me of like, Anna, let's compete at chess again. We got this. And I thought that was really fun. I thought that was really, really, really fun. And I'm a competitive chess player at heart. I love competing at chess. So to me, to see that I can play well against grandmasters, it like truly means a lot. So I was super happy. I'm going to insert a clip here of my reaction after the game. <laughs> oh, guys, I am so proud, actually, though. I am so proud. Like, I'm so proud. I am so, I am so proud. I am actually so proud. Like, <laughs> um, wow, I am actually really happy. I hope that you enjoy the analysis of this game. Thank you so much for watching. And let's all keep improving to beat grandmasters or players that are stronger than us. Thank you so much for watching this video.